Hi everyone, my name is Jaren Mink, and I'm excited to present our work on the forensic value of a reduced audit log. An audit log is a recorded history of executed events within a system, and in particular, kernel-level frameworks allow one to ubiquitously track application system calls. This proves especially useful in incident response in which the root cause or downstream impacts of long-lived attack campaigns can be determined. Indeed, 75% of analysts agree with us that logs are the most important resource when investigating threats. However, this is not without consequence. In just a single month, a normal computer can create upwards of one terabyte of log data. Therefore, companies are reluctant to activate logging or require frequent purging of the log and thus reducing the utility to a small time frame. Given the importance of logging, this problem has inspired a literature of work that attempts to determine what portions of a log are essential to keep and what portions of a log might be reasonably removed. For instance, some of this data might not be needed for a particular goal, it might be redundant, or it might be able to be reasonably approximated. So to show an example, let's imagine that you are an analyst, and you would like to know where process A sent some data. Well, given an original audit log of process A sending 99 network packets to server.com, you'd have your answer very clearly. However, one can also imagine a reasonable approximation might be to simply blur that timestamp and say that process A sent a single network packet to server.com. Well, with either the original log or the approximated log, you'd get the same conclusion, which would be a win given the re extremely reduced size of the approximated log. However, let's imagine another scenario. Let's imagine that you are a bit less concerned that server.com is speaking with process at A, and you're a bit more concerned that process A might be exfiltrating data through other means. Specifically, you're worried that process A might be using a timing channel that depends on the delays of the network packets that it sends out. Well, with prior work, you can actually get some sort of conclusion based off of this. Given a series of timestamps, you can actually determine the entropy of the network packets and thus whether it might be hiding secret information. However, you cannot use those same techniques given the approximated log as it only contains one stamp. Therefore, conclusions might differ. And so this inspires our research question. How much information is kept for completely arbitrary analyst goals under different threat models? It's often convenient to express an audit log as a provenance graph. In one of these graphs, the node denotes system objects such as files and processes, while the edges denote interdependent events between them, such as reads, writes, forks, or any other system call. So for instance, if an analyst was suspicious of an open socket, they could actually trace backwards up the provenance graph to determine which processes were involved in it, what data was sent, and ultimately the root cause of this malicious process. However, these malicious entities don't exist in, in isolation, but rather in a sea of benign events. In this work, we define perfect forensic evidence as the ability to make arbitrary provenance graph queries given a threat model and a subset of the data to query over. Utilizing this as an example, we'll see what the ideal approximation of this graph is underneath each of our defined forensic metrics. Under the lossless forensic metric, we assume that our adversary might diverge from system level abstractions and thus might utilize side channel information, such as the timing and frequency of system calls to communicate with colluding processes. Therefore, if we wish to preserve all possible information, then our ideal approximation of the original provenance graph is simply the same provenance graph. However, we can relax this. If we now assume that our adversary does abide by system level abstractions and thus only utilize explicit modes of information between the colluding processes, then if we can guarantee that our approximated graph contains the same information flow as the original provenance graph, we can be sure that we have the same amount of forensic evidence while having the potential to achieve reduced storage spaces. More specifically, if between the source and destination of two entities, there is no change in state, but there are multiple reads or multiple writes, we can collapse these into a single IO operation. Lastly, if we state that we only care about malicious information within the provenance graph, then we now come to our attack preserving forensic metric. Under this metric, we only care about information flow that is uniquely malicious. Our definition of this is an event that has either directly or indirectly been influenced by a malicious entity and does not have a benign equivalent. 
We believe that this is a reasonable thing to do, as this information is what uniquely signifies a malicious actor and is thus what is interesting to forensic analysts. Underneath this, we can achieve the maximal amount of storage gains while still retaining forensically interesting and relevant information. Utilizing these metrics, we can calculate the amount of forensic validity left over in an approximated audit log. If g sub i represents the reduction method i to g, and g sub m represents the ideal approximation of g given metric m, and e simply produces a set of edges, then the amount of forensic validity left over is simply the number of shared edges between the ideal graph and the reduction graph over the number of edges of the ideal graph. This brings us to logaprox, which attempts to preserve anomalous information within the audit log while aggressively reducing commonplace and repetitive information. Looking back at our Firefox example, we note that long-running processes do not typically read and write to a single file, but rather a series of files. For Firefox, this might be a list of cached pages that vary slightly in name and directory, but are ultimately semantically similar in nature. The same can be said for the libraries from which it loads, which have a similar purpose, but are named slightly differently. And now we can begin to look for reduction opportunities. It's important to note that for the majority of audit logs, most of these system events are actually file IO operations. Therefore, if we have a reduction method that can target these IO operations, we can significantly reduce the audit log as a whole. A lot of methods currently rely on causally collapsing multiple reads and multiple writes into a single I.O. operation. However, they are unable to do so for semantically similar files as they are distinct. Our goal of logaprox is to approximate these semantically singular files under a single regex and thus be able to causally collapse many of these reads and writes into singular I.O. operations. Let's now look at how logaprox actually performs this reduction. For a given audit log, and for each process within that audit log, Logaprox will create a list of full file paths for every file that was involved with I.O. in that particular process. Logaprox will then be begin creating groups out of these files. It will start with a single lone file and create a single group. From here, this file will be compared with every other file, and if the end file name similarity is greater than alpha, and the distance of different directories up to that file name has no more than beta differences, then the compared file will be added to the group. Once there are no more files, Logaprox will then begin by creating another group. This will continue until there are no more files in the file paths list. From here, Logaprox will create a single regex that can represent each group. If there is a misaligned token between any two files in the group, Logaprox will replace it with a glob. These regex templates will then be applied back onto the original provenance graph. From here, causal reduction can take place and thus multiple reads and writes to semantically similar files can be causally collapsed into a single IO operation. Logaprox achieves some notable properties. First, Logaprox only reduces repetitive local file IO. Therefore, if an attacker uses network I.O., which might be important in lateral movement, or any other system call that might be important in the coordination of malicious processes, this information will be perfectly preserved. Additionally, any anomalous local file I.O. will still be preserved. Therefore, if a process accesses a file that it would not normally access, such as a sensitive file, this information will not be reduced. Additionally, Logaprox only ever approximates information and doesn't ever completely delete it. Therefore, if an attacker does use a regex to template some of their actions, we can still produce an end-to-end -end causal graph of the full attack. However, we might admit some false dependencies. All this is to say that Logaprox can achieve high reduction rates while still preserving anomalous behavior. We then compare Logaprox against a series of reduction techniques. Causality preserving reduction, which preserves information flow. LogGC, which tries to remove audit logs that do not affect the current state of the system and full and source dependency preserving reduction that focuses on the single analyst task of preserving dependencies between entities. The details of each algorithm are in the paper and we encourage you to check it out. To evaluate these reduction techniques, we curated a set of real world vulnerabilities and ran real exploits on them. These audit logs were then passed into each of the evaluated reduction techniques. The reduced log was then evaluated for its space efficiency and for its forensic validity. We can visualize these results in the 2D plane. 
The x-axis corresponds to the amount of forensic validity achieved by each reduced log, and the y-axis corresponds to the reduction rate of the reduced log compared to the original log. Ideally, techniques would be able to place them in the upper right-hand corner and achieve high reduction rates while also achieving high forensic validity. We also plot the worst-case baseline in, when, in which each dropped event is also forensically relevant. Underneath the lossless forensic metric, no technique can do better than the worst case. This is intuitive, as the lossless metric assumes that every dropped event is a loss in utility. We can gain a bit more of an insight into the goals of these reduction techniques if we plot the causality-preserving metrics. Causality-preserving reduction ensures that all information flow in the approximated graph is kept, and therefore achieves perfect forensic validity while also achieving between 8 to 43% of log reduction rates. Log GC, on the other hand, is a bit more aggressive, actively deleting information it believes is irrelevant to the current state of the system, and therefore gets forensic validity of about 90% while achieving comparable reduction rates. In contrast, full and source dependency preserving reduction only care about a specific analyst goal, and therefore they have wildly varying forensic validity that goes between 40 to 94%. However, because they only care about this specific goal, they're also able to achieve extremely high reduction rates, as much as 94%. Lastly, if we plot log approx, we're able to get fairly high reduction rates compared to log GC and causality preserving reduction. However, we see a loss in forensic validity. This is because log approx actively attempts to remove information it believes is repetitive or commonplace. This is information that causality preserving forensics cares about. However, the story changes when we begin to look at the attack-preserving forensics. Plotting prior work against the attack-preserving forensics, we see that all prior work generally experiences the same pattern as it did with the causality-preserving forensics. This seems to imply that all prior work does not focus on whether the information is malicious or benign. In contrast, Logaprox focus on anomalous events specifically seems to tailor to these malicious entities that are within the system, and because of this, it's able to achieve 100% forensic validity while also achieving a reduction rate that's above both of the conservative reduction techniques of CPR and LogGC. So I'd love for you to leave this talk with some takeaways. First, the validity of a reduction technique should not be based on anecdotal studies. The value of an audit log depends greatly on the specific task and the specific threat model that an analyst is up against. Instead, providing a continuous metric for arbitrary queries under some assumptions is a step in the right direction. Second, reduction techniques can be tailored to fit these specific tasks and these specific threats. A great example of a task-specific reduction technique is a source and full dependency preserving. Given that this is the technique that an analyst wishes to use, is able to achieve incredibly high reduction rates and thus is perfectly suited for that task. However, we believe that this assumption is a bit brittle. Instead, we argue that having log reduction techniques that fit to a specific threat model, such as log approx, is a better way to ensure that these reduction techniques are able to provide value to the analysts when the time comes. Thank you so much, and I'd love to answer any questions you guys have.